and then I've just made them up. Uh, good evening, Gnaz Kenna, Tortoise Capital. This is the foundation. Let's see, first, yeah, foundations Q and A for uh, January fourth, twenty twenty four. Let's just uh, do a quick check in, and uh, let me know if you have any specific questions. I didn't receive any from email, so I have some other prepared material. Let's uh, give you a chance to chime in. Uh, Brian, how you doing? Been a while. Unmute. Uh, great, thanks, Ken. Just sort of getting through a busy period and um, we'll get a chance to get back into the trading again. I've got to turn up my audio here. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, I was sitting in on a drumming session this morning, some shamanic drumming. And uh, the guy had his drum right next to the microphone, and it was a 24-inch uh, 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 Indian Native American drum. The I forget what they call that. The uh, is that the powwow drum? But it's, it's the big, the big 24-inch head on that thing, and it was it was so co close to the microphone that it was having fritzing out on with overtones and I had to turn my audio down so I could barely hear you. But I, I got you. Good to have you back. And uh, Kevin, what, how are things going? Uh, doing okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've am i been working on the, just using Mexico because the, the small wicks, uh, just going to the one minute. Um, just trying to get the time in to, and I, uh, it's going well. I just, you know, the problem with um, it's it's in a Z three pinch, like yeah. two thirds of the day. Yeah. yeah. And then coming in and out of it, like I, I'd been doing pretty good with it, and today I just I was caught in it. It was kind of almost big enough to trade inside of it, but it it faked me out. Both it was sucked. It was it, bad. It will it will happen that way, you know when it's. When the Z3 lines pinch like that, you know, there's uh, there's some moment when it's like super pinched and other times when it, it really has momentum. You know, it's a trending move and then, it, you know, it does this crap. And uh, the, the middle zone is really hard to trade. This this bracket in here is really hard to trade because you know your uh, your wrist box might only be like this big, and so it'll make a breakout and then it'll immediately chop and then you'll short it'll go this way. So you get caught in the chop. It's almost impossible to trade inside here. Okay, yeah. So if I'm struggling there, that's normal. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, so what we want to do, the, the two times that it really works is when you have a abnormal momentum, so very long trends, because the same size box over here, you know, that, right. same, that same box will give you multiple, multiple legs. And then that same box over here will look like this. You have the uh, the Bollinger Band mean will have gone sideways. You know, that's the middle of the river. Yep. And then the uh, then the breakout will work. So, do, do would you pick a would you pick a side? Like I was thinking, yeah. you pick a I, I like a long bias or a short bias. Try get in near the bottom of the pinch and then just wait it out or yeah. what? Yeah, there's there's two ways to do. That. There's the conservative one, uh, and then a, an aggressive for the uh, for the super pinch right so uh, and then there's sort of the there's a I guess I would call it a, just a coin flip so on the conservative one 
what you do is you wait for you wait for this breakout of the Z3 line. Um, and you just go with it. And then you use the whole box as the uh, as the as the trailing stop. Right. Uh, or you you wait for this one on the downside. So that's sort of the conservative play. Uh, the aggressive play is to say, excuse me, if uh, if the width of the Z3 channel is less than a frog box, then you have abnormal pinch, right? Uh, and then what? Then the aggressive play uh, is to play is to play this. You wait for like a one, two, three entry off the bottom. And then you use, you still use that same size box as your, use a multiple of that for your position size. So the idea is that's going to work uh, right away or it's going to fail. And what you'll get is, if it's if you can if you can get that move, it'll it'll. I should probably let me see if I can make that drawing any smaller. Yeah. Uh, if it just goes to the top of the channel, then you have a decent fractional move in your favor. You know you're going to be able to capture that move, right? And then if it fails, well. You you don't you didn't believe in that trade anyway because it was in a channel, and so you maybe you get a point seven, something like that. Yep. But then if it breaks out, that's the place where your conservative guy is making his entry. So while he's, while this guy is just getting ready to make his entry, uh, you're moving your stop to lock in the game, right? And, and your stop on this one is probably just outside the channel. And so when he's making his entry, you're locking in, you're locking in your game. Yep. So you're essentially trying to pick the top and bottom of the channel. But you're hoping for a break. You're, you're hoping for either the breakout this time or you're hoping that that thing fails right away. Because now you have, you gave it a chance to make the channel trade, but then it puts you right into the breakout trade that way. Yeah. Which you, which you want. So you're re on this on this little cycle, you're really only risking a tiny sliver of your normal MMRB. So your uh, your criteria for getting in is not elaborate. In fact, it looks like a it looks like this, as long as it's a higher low. So if this thing sold off and it touched, you know, was near the end of the channel, all you wanted to do is open and then give you an, uh, a one, two entry. And then you're in. Okay. Yeah. And then your, your wrist box, your, your normal MMRB looks something like that. But you're really going to execute right here. That's the place where you, you're not going to stick around and, and just wait to see a full one execution risk. Just because, hey, here's my normal execution risk box, so I'm just going to buy. And then I'm going to sit on my hands and, and uh, give it the full one. No, you're, you have a very specific technical price that tells you when this trade fails. And it's a tiny little sliver of your MMR. The MMRB is already, and this is how, this is when, you know, I mean, you're freaking desperate to trade. You want to trade if you want to do this, right? Because you have a frog box that looks like this. And a frog a frog box is typically like three, three frog boxes is equal to about an average range, right? 
the average daily range looks like that. And then the fourth one, if you put it on there, is what the range stat looks like. And then we know that if you take the range stat and divide that by 10, or about one-third of the frog box, that's what the MMRB looks like. So the MMRB is already a very uh, one-tenth a fraction of the daily move. But then on this little technique, this one-two entry, you're only taking a sliver of the MMRB. So the amount of adverse move is really insignificant. So, but, this, but it's justified because the width of the channel is so narrow. And then if it doesn't break out of the channel, you, you want to be able to at least capture a micro gain. That's good. It goes to the far side and it, it rejects. Uh, but then if your trade fails immediately, you're already short on a conservative entry on the like a collapsing dragon or a collapsing out of the so you don't wait for the full one or loss. In fact, the right way to trade that is when you see that happening. So if I see prices moving down inside the channel, and here's my channel, and I see that price did this just like it normally does, what I'm, what I'm betting on is that when this thing gets down here, it's going to do something like this. You know, and, and come up here like that. So I'm an, in this at, in this moment here. I'm anticipating that it's going to turn. So I'm going to do something like have a uh, a trailing entry, and before it even gets there, I'm going to have my uh, I'm going to have a um, the breakout short order right here ready to go which is going to be the stop loss if this trade fails. So I've already got the stop and reverse order in like like two units. So I've got two units of risk on that one. This is a two. And then I'm going to go long one right here. So I'm long one, and then if it immediately fails through the channel, it hits that, and I'm net short one. And now I'm in the conservative reversal. And I've only taken a small, I've only taken a very small uh, loss. That's if there's absolutely nothing going on, and you just, you just feel, well, because you're specializing in something, and you say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to make that trade. And you're not risking much. Because you know, what we would say that if, if most breakouts are false, then that means that the fit when it comes down here, the failure to break out to the bottom is in for, and it starts to reverse is an affirmation that the most likely course of action is to go up and test the upper limit of the, of the channel. That's why when you're studying those, uh, those symbol, the symbols that you're specializing in, and you watch them for many days, what you want to look for is what's it look like when it's in those long sideways noise channels? How big is that? You can't really trade inside that, you know. Uh, but as it's starting, as the as these Z three lines are starting to compress. As soon as that gets within less than a frog box, this, this aggressive style can start working where you're trading inside the channel. So that's so the conservative play is to wait for it to break out of a Z3 pinch. And the aggressive one is to try to try to get it at the turning point in the channel and then ready to stop and reverse the immediate failure. All right. The coin flip is something like you've got the channel here and it's really sideways and there's the Bollinger Band main and it kind of goes like this. That thing is so tight. You flip a coin, literally. Literally flip a coin. 
and go go one way or the other, and then use you're using half a risk. What I mean, what it, what does it feel like? This one feels like it's going long because you have that micro. Uh, okay, pick one, and then just get it right on the Bollinger Band. I mean, I call that buying it on the button. Okay. Now here's where that can work. Suppose, suppose you were in Mexico, and you were you were seeing it in that tight channel, and all day SPY was in the channel, and now you see the S and P make a move, but EWW right. hasn't moved yet. You got about a minute. You're on one minute charts anyway, right? Yeah. That might be the one where you just say, you know what? I'm going to go with the broader market, and I can buy it on the button, and I'm going to use a half a low. I'm going to use half a MMRB as my risk, but I'm I'm going to stop and reverse if it goes right there. And now you're now when it comes up, and it goes when it breaks out of the channel, you're already locking in a gain. You're at no lose plus dinner for two. And right. then if it's then if it's a false breakout, no sweat. You're not gonna get. You're gonna get a fraction. So that's what I think of that one is buying on the button or the coin flip. And I only do that on ones that I am really proficient with. And it's not in the first couple hours. It's that in that doldrums during the lunch hour. And especially as it's starting to move towards the afternoon trade, and everything is quieted down, and you can't make any money in the market then. That's a good time to do that one, because you start they start waking up because they're starting to wake up for the afternoon trade and and they're gonna start posturing uh, for the uh, towards the close. So so that's that's one way to do that. Now, I guess a fourth one would be the uh, fake one go to, and this actually combines. The conservative and the aggressive. So I've got the, I've got the Z3 lines, that have pinched, and now I'm I'm clearly. In, in an abnormally compressed channel, and it just can't get any tighter than that, right? It's the absence of breakouts. So the fake. So what it, my, my frog box looks something like this. So I'm clearly, pinched. If that's the frog box. We know that the MMRB has something like uh, is one third of a frog box, so it that's about the size of it. So let's say that I'm I, I get some price action, and now I get the breakout. So I get long. It would be helpful on that because now I actually have like an emerging dragon. So I'm long. I give that about three bars. In three bars, that thing should have broken out high enough that I'm thinking that my MMRB lets me do this and lock in that little game. If, if, if this thing has gone three bars... And then reverses. I just like to cut it off right there. And now I'm into the aggressive channel trade. And what I'm looking for is to just get the, I'm looking to get the far side of the channel as my, as my target. And then if that breaks down, then I already have gained the width of the channel to the good at a place where I was happy to get short. So this thing has to like fail within three bars for that to be the case. Because then all that looks like is I had a channel and it, it blipped up and then immediately reversed and it's doing that. Yep. So, you know, so I was in this channel. And then there is one little fake breakout, and then it reverses, and then it's back inside this channel. So, if this ha if this reversal 
back to the upper skin of the channel happens within like three bars. Uh, then, then I actually am playing for it. Fake one, go two. And and because uh, you'll the phenomenon looks like this: you have the tight channel, and you get it's been in here, and then you get one, two, three, four, and then w one of those two directional. You're starting to get this this expanding range. You just don't know which one is going to be the one, but it usually only takes one or two legs to make that happen. Like they fake one and then they're going to go hard the other way. You know, uh, so this is almost like, uh, you know, uh, barbell trading. You get, you get a big move and then this tiny little handle and then it goes fake one, go to big reversal, big. Re and, and it's, it's these big move periods that you get those large directional moves and it's easy. So when it when it's first coming out of that channel, I like playing that. I like playing the breakout from the Z3, but then if it fails immediately, I'm short, and then I think it's fake one, go two. And if you get me twice on two losing trades in a row, you got me for two losing trades in a row. I don't care. We'll just we'll total it up at the end of the day and see what happens. One of the advantages of trading the frog champions in this style is that compared to other symbols, they have uh, large bodies and small wicks, whereas um, something like IWM actually has large wicks and small bodies. And that's a reflection that you get a, you get a lot of trading activity between the high and the low because it's a choice it's a it's an instrument of choice for intraday active traders why well compared to DIA DIA only has 30 components and they're huge and if Microsoft starts moving it's big enough that it can move DIA so there's guys that are Microsoft traders and uh, index traders and uh, tech traders and whatever. There's a lot of things that move Microsoft around. And it's hard just because Microsoft is moving, international paper's not going to move. And the Dow is a very diverse index. So it tends to have fat tails in a small body. And IWM is like that too. The breakouts fail. But if I have a small if I have a symbol like Devon Energy, well first of all, in terms of the S&P 500, energy is only about 8% of the entire S&P. So it's already a very narrowly traded sector. And Devon Energy is just barely a large cap, but it's a domestic U.S. oil company and distribution company. So he is a small fraction of just the energy sector, whereas ExxonMobil and Chevron, they're a huge component of XLE. So Devon Energy, really, most of the, if this is the range at and uh, the S&P accounts for that much, XLE accounts for that much, and then there's a bunch of guys just trading Devon Energy. So when it moves, it has small wicks and a large body. So if the body is the signal and the wicks are noise, all other things being equal, I would like to trade things that have large directional trends in one direction each day. And so on a day where Devon moves like that, maybe XLE only moves like that. And XLE entered here, moved here, moved there, and finished there. So it only had a small 
real body, and even the size of the intraday trends was not large. But Devon Energy could have entered here, gone all the way up and closed there, and now I have the chance to build a large position with one long, strong move. What you get with EWW is kind of a blend because it's only about 0.5 or less correlated to the S&P. It can actually be directional when the S&P is pure sideways. And it's about twice to three times as volatile. So on a day where the S&P moves that much from high to the low, uh, EWW can move that much and it's much more likely to make a big, long, strong move. So that's sort of, but at the same time, it's an aggregation of the entire Mexican economy, which is the largest uh, emerging market in the world, which is nice, because it now has very strong telecom and energy and industrials and agriculture and drugs and finance and all that stuff. So you're getting a blended return of multiple sectors, so you get all the benefits of a truly diversified broad economy, but you get the extra volatility and the percent moves of a small cap or, uh, you know, uh, not a mega cap. And it has a very high signal-to-noise ratio. So EWW and Brazil are both, in my view, ideal candidates because they they have a the blended characteristics that I look for in a frog champion they also have the added characteristics that over the course of uh, of a swing trade of let's say five days they tend to be very directional as well so if you can get so if this is on day one and then day two then day three and four and five you could actually get a turning point on day one and that thing has a big directional day down I should really draw this as a you could get uh, you know four days down and then one day up so you end up getting uh, a turning point like this on day one That, that comes all the way down to here. So you get that big downward move, and then you get three days of momentum of large directional moves. So you get a swing trade for three days, but you also got large directional moves on each of those three days. So you get some intraday turbo, and then on the fourth day or something, you might experience the turning point, which might lead it into those big, long, smooth trends. So you get tradable days in the middle of swing trades. So Brazil and Mexico and Devon Energy and Cliff Natural Resources and Wynn Casinos, W-Y-N-N, and I'm noticing international paper has this quality too. You get a combination of large directional moves intraday, so it's a daily frog champion, but it also has uh, strong directional moves on the swing trade. So it's a, it's a swing frog champion. So it's sort of like, to me, the, the ideal candidate for this kind of statistical trading. So when I do the, K, the Kata 2 challenge, the two symbols that I coach people to use are Brazil and DIA. Because if you think about if the S&P is the market, what you get with DIA are all the mega caps, so you have less volatility but greater reliability. That moves when, when the diamonds actually do break out and go, it has the weight of 30 large caps, mega caps, all moving in tandem, and that's kind of a reflection of a really strong market. It's not diverted by the small caps and the other components like uh, like you might see in uh, in the S and P.
So it's very strongly correlated to the S&P. But when it makes a turn, you can actually engineer a really tight stop and, and trade the channel. So you get a very conservative, reliable trading vehicle that is strongly correlated to the market. And that allows you to practice trading uh, a target and the broader market. And then it's easy to go from DIA to Microsoft or Intel or um, ExxonMobil or JP Morgan. And then that teaches you to, you could play, you could now play XLK and learn to trade a tech sector or the or a couple components of a tech sector. Very, very easy to stretch your span of control in that direction. Or you could trade XLF, the finance sector, or JP Morgan. Or you could trade XLE energy or ExxonMobil. Or and then you can add Devon Energy, and now you can say, I could trade the conservative large cap energy or essentially a mid-cap U.S. energy and get the extra volatility. So that now teaches, or I could go the other direction towards Brazil, and now the correlation coefficient is only about 0.5. And there are days when the S&P is up and Brazil is up. That's easy because now I can go, now the whole market is going together. Then there are days when the S&P is sideways but Brazil could be strong up or strong down. And now you see, oh, that's Brazil moving on its own, not being contaminated with the S&P. And then interestingly, there are days when you get a secular move, you get a strong move up in the S&P and a long-term downward move in Brazil, which is usually part of like Latin America suffering, usually a political move. And when you get that kind of divergence, you know, that's everybody forsaking the global trade and bringing all the money back to the U.S. How could that happen? Well, you might have had a case where uh, energy is coming way down, and so the, uh, the business cycle is working, and the U.S. is doing really good, and uh, Brazil is doing even better because they're selling products. Uh, to the U.S., and then this thing gets to an exaggeratedly large um, win over the U.S., and then guys start saying, oh, you know what? Um, maybe it's time to start preserving that outsized gain, and then maybe the U.S. gets flat or starts going down, and then momentum happens, and then you get um, you get Brazil then goes through a dramatic underperformance until it starts to rotate up. And maybe down in here you get some political instability and that causes it to sell off even more. And now you're, you're getting a great value trade in Brazil and it plays the reversion to the mean to the U.S. So, so one of the reasons I picked Brazil as the pair of DIA is that you get to see how a symbol that is not strongly correlated to the S&P works, but which is very liquid and has strong intraday directional moves and also makes really good longer term swing trades and can be driven by macroeconomics. And they have their own currency and they have their own futures market and it's a very large economy. It's one of the bricks for crying out loud. So. Uh, you get a lot of people interested in Brazil because it's not the U.S. And if you think about Brazil, Brazil's just sitting down here in South America. It's not the U.S. It's not Japan. It's not China. It's not Europe. It's not Russia. It's just Brazil. It's just this giant broadly diversified economy that is the engine of South America and is partnering with emerging powers to create its own economic giant. So 
it's tradable just on its own. So I like to compare Brazil and DIA because they express a lot of different kinds of ideas. Like if you're a macro trader or a fundamental trader or a news trader, you can actually see real differences of behavior in how DIA, SPY, and Brazil all work together. So a, a pair trade I like is at EWZ versus EWW. So I trade them both, but they tip, one of them is typically leading the way, you know. When ILF, which is the uh, 40 mega caps in Latin America across multiple countries, when Latin America ILF is doing better than the SPY, it's either Brazil or Mexico leading the way. One of those two is dominating. And it becomes clear where the momentum is, where the strong signal are. And so I can pick between those two just on that on a relative strength basis. So that turns out to be a useful way to learn the basics of the pattern, but also to get introduced to some of these other kinds of strategies that later on we can develop into situational or scenario-based trading. Um, there was a comment I just noticed on there. Let's see, Greg says, um, yeah, uh, yeah, Greg is talking about using, hey, if I've got a tight, Z3 pinch, and then maybe I get the breakout and I was using an MMRB, maybe the next time, I guess I'm, may, maybe if I use a, a, on a reversal, maybe I want to use a full frog box and give it more room because of the increasing volatility. I mean, that's a, that's a possibility too. Or I might, I might say, if I straddle this with a frog box, wait for it to break out below before. And that's almost like just, just waiting for the breakout from the Z3s. That, that's, there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah. That's, that's sort of like, that is a more conservative response to the fake one go to. Because what I was describing was, if I've got a Z3 pinch and this thing fails right away, I like to get short right away and trade the channel and then if it breaks out here, again, my stop, which is close, I, I'm getting it in here, so I'm getting paid. The conservative way to play that is, look, hey, I'm trying the breakout, and if it fails right away, I'm just going to scratch the trade at the channel, and then nothing. And I'm going to wait for the next iteration of breakout, or break down and I'm not going to try to do anything inside of this inside of this chop like I might even wait hey let me wait 15 minutes and and see what happens if it turns out that there were no breakouts in 15 minutes in that 15 minute period then that really was a fake that was just noise but if I decide I'm going to I'm going to wait 15 minutes, but this thing comes down here and it goes that way. And I see in retrospect, there's fake one, go, go two, go 10. I'm really going to be pissed about arbitrarily picking a 15 minute waiting period. So rather than suffer that, I just say, screw it. I'm using a real, now remember if I, if I get short here, I've got even less than an MR, MMRB there anyway, because I'm actually trading the break in, not the break out from the channel, but the break back into the channel. And I'm really thinking I'm only going to get the channel anyway. So if this is my channel, then my risk to reward, my the amount of adverse action I can only take is going to be small compared to the anticipated too. So, I mean, uh, if it's, I mean, I only do this at lunchtime, and I only do it on my absolute all-time favorite things like Alcoa, Mexico, Brazil, Devon, Cliff, and lately, IP. 
That's all. I mean, and, and it's uh, oh, there's nothing else happening. So, and it just drives me nuts to be sitting there just watching the market and fiddle fiddling around. Maybe I don't have any papers left to grade while I'm waiting for the next bar to print. You know, so that that's kind of how I would think of that. I mean, probably over answered that question for you, but there we are. Um, so just for the record, I want to, uh, starting in 2024, there's, there's a lot more office hours going on. And so I want to clarify, uh, what they are. First of all, the foundation's Q and A that we're in right now meets on Sunday mornings at nine to 10 and Thursday evenings like tonight from seven to eight. So foundations hits right here and right here. And the purpose is, look, foundation students can attend free for life. There's no better deal in the world than that, by the way. Um, the intention of the foundation's Q&A is clarifying lessons or concepts that's covered in a specific foundation's course that's unclear in your mind. Yeah, I mean, So it's really, it's you trying to learn my style of trading just to learn the technique. So it's very much specific technique oriented and, you know, learning to use the tools. So the purpose of these Q and A's is to lock in foundational concepts so that you can proceed with your own adaptation. But after you've been in, at some point when you've been in the foundations long enough that you got it. And now you're starting to really develop your own, uh, your own adaptation. So it's normal then to start doing things like Luke with the five-minute Aussie and he's kind of developing his own rule sets and doing his own research. And he, he's making variations that make sense to him and his techniques. So that's typically when a guy wants to add to his own creativity, then the Creativity 202 course is how you go f beyond foundations, even beyond my advanced techniques in day and swing and whatever. But you're really just looking to refresh and become creative to support your own research. Then Creativity 202, which is also a lifelong course, you can attend Creativity 202 forever. And the check-ins are on Sundays, 10 to 11, and Tuesdays, 7 to 8. So creativity checks in here and here. Now, those check-ins are different than foundations. Like, the boys are not asking questions and then me answering. Most of creativity 202, the check-in, are the students talking about if there's four students, four of them are taking 10 minutes to report on the work that they did that week. And then there's maybe me for about five minutes talking about the work that I've been doing. And so the Creativity 202 course is each of these students is working on a specific creativity lesson that they were working on that week. And what typically happens is you get a Fletcher, you get an Angus Fletcher creativity exercise. You get a trading exercise from me. And those are both designed to make you go, hmm. And then you think about it and you apply it and you do the exercise. And then you do a learning journal for the aha moments. And then you come to the session and you tell a, you know, three to five minute true story about the aha moment that was triggered by one of those two exercises or by something else that just happened that week that was just amazing. The most interesting, amazing, surprising thing that happened that week or the Fletcher exercise or my exercise. So one of those three things creates a learning moment, an aha moment, 
that you journal about. It gives you big insights. And then you tell a concise elevator speech story about it. And then with the excess, if there's any excess time, we have a second round where we kind of just discuss and kick it around. So it's a very different focus than the foundation's Q&A. But it is connected to specific lessons in the Creativity 202 course. So a guy come in and say, hey, like Joe came in this week and said, he was working on lessons 14 and 15, and here's what he found and he discovered, and then we had a conversation about that. The new program I started this year is small group coaching on Monday nights, which meets from 7 to 8. So that's something where you're not, con you're not talking about a foundations lesson or a creativity lesson. It's your own personal work in progress. And you're coming in reporting on the research that you're doing for that week. And the idea is to create a set of 52 weekly sessions where you come in and report on the use like a true story, where you come in and give a concise executive summary. Here's the work that I was I did this week and the insight and where I'm going and what the next steps look like and how are the and it's it's almost like show and tell in a wood shop where you're showing your project as it's being developed. And then the other guys are all working on their own projects and I'm in there to help coach. So we just kind of go around the horn and do show and tell on your work in progress, plus a little bit of coaching, and then a what are the next steps for the week ahead, and then off we go. So it's a built-in accountability partnering and some collaboration, and you end up just getting more ideas because you're hearing four or five other traders talking about, and sometimes that's all you need to clear up a log jam. But it's very clear that what's driving the work in the small group coaching is your own well-defined work in progress where you have a specific project and, you know, milestones and evaluation criteria. There's a very clear plan for what it is you want to do. And we're just using that weekly coaching session as a way uh, to build in consistency and a forcing function to it'll make you do the work that you were thinking maybe I just don't want to do no I gotta say something next week I don't want to waste the money and I don't want to let down my friends so it drives you to do your best work so uh, that meets on Mondays on Wednesdays for the next 12 or 13 weeks we're just going to talk about the foundation's book. And we have a reading schedule that's going to take us through the 315 pages of that book. And each week, uh, I'm going to clarify and answer questions. It'll be a Q&A specifically about that, those pages in that book in that session. That's all I'm going to talk about is clarifying the the book itself and we're going to record that so when we're done with it at the end of March we're going to have a series of probably you know 12 hours of recorded Q&A that will become part of a home study course so in the future people could buy the book and buy the tapes of the Q&As or whatever and you know get it build an additional product so we're using that course as a way to build a resource to make the book a better value. So that's the book club that meets on Wednesdays. The final one is uh, I announced I'm willing to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if someone doesn't want to do the small group coaching, maybe doesn't want to work in that on a weekly basis but they want that personal coaching that that is a 
well, first of all, the small group coaching is an annual program, priced at that. The small, the one-on-one coaching, is also priced at twenty-four ninety-seven. But that's just like a coupon book, where you can get ten sessions of coaching with me, that never expire. So whenever you're ready to work on whatever it is you want to be coached on, it may not be a trading system. It may be something else. But we just those are going to be unique one-on-one sessions, uh, private consultation, and then we work on we have a plan for each session. We conduct the session. We do feedback, and we get to closure. And that may be all on one project. It might be ten different things, but whatever a person wants coaching on, then we're going to do that as a bespoke coaching. So that's not part of the normal office hours, and the recording will be private to the person that I'm doing the coaching with. So um, anyway, that's what the the new standard week is going to look like in 2024. The point I want to make is that, that I think the two really good deals are the structured instruction in foundations and creativity, that's buy once and have it for life to include all future recordings of the Q&As and any new material I drop in there. Uh, and then the small group coaching is if you work better in small groups on your own. Pro- it turns out that the, the projects you work for in the small group coaching are the kinds of things that you would contribute in the research workshop each year. You saw presentations from guys that worked all year on some of that stuff. Like Jeff and Sonal and Luke have been working on that various projects for 10 years. And that was just their annual check-in with me. And so at some point when you become a self-actualized trader, and and if you still want to, if the stuff we're doing is still making sense for you, the group coaching is sort of a natural way for you to Work on your own stuff and report back to the tribe and get get coaching in that way. So that's what I wanted to clarify uh, for the people uh, who are thinking about what, hey, what's going on with all these different meetings? They're all in the same spot. And then every night at 8.30, Monday through Thursday is the, the podcast anyway. And then it starts at 9.30 on Friday night because... I have a soccer academy practice, which takes priority. Um, And then in my view, you know, this is the lab work for guys who are in the foundations course and who are doing case studies. When When you've taken the foundations course and you're trading and you want feedback specifically on your trade, you post it in the chat room, and I'll give you the feedback on it, and that's what's happening in the nightly podcast, which includes hybrid swing trading, so you're the 30 symbols or so that I track. I'm just commenting on my own uh, hybrid swing trading, um, plus sniper trade of the day, so for the short-term intraday three-minute chart, uh, and then I do some coaching where I review the cases that have been posted and then commentary on the report. So those are the four elements. So there's a little bit of teaching, but there's also just some operational things going on. I think of the reports and the hybrid swing trading as market commentary to set conditions for tomorrow's trade. So in the Army, what we think about, we think about uh, plans and operations And then we have uh, training and exercise. So we have some guys that are focusing on building skills and learning, and then we have other guys that are doing. So this is live trading, and this is learning to trade. And I see there's a – I think the best way to learn to trade at some point is you got to go out into the world and trade and come back and learn. Skin in the game. But when you're just kind of learning the concepts in the workshops, that's you're on that side. The nightly podcast with the hybrid swing, the sniper trades of the day, 
commenting on your live trades and doing the reports. That's plans and ops. That's ongoing day-to-day just the work of trading. Um, and the work is driving the content. Uh, on these other check-ins, the content is driving the content. You know, the lessons are driving the content. Plus your questions. Right? All right, so that's what I wanted to cover for tonight, just to get some clarifications. Uh, last call for alcohol. Any final comments or anything from the boys? Okay. Uh, then uh, I declare... I declare that uh, we have achieved victory, and um, and I'm going to chill for half an hour then for the next podcast. All right, I'll see you in a few if you're there. Take good care. Cool. Uh, Thanks, keep Ken. marching, guys. You're doing good.